China's International Import Expo showcases some of the world's leading companies and their products in Shanghai. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu. This is The Heat. Business leaders from 154 countries, regions and international organizations are in Shanghai this week for the sixth annual China International Import Expo. A huge range of products and the latest in technology are on display inside the National Exhibition and Convention Center. China's leadership reiterated its commitment to high-level opening up with greater market opportunities for foreign companies. This year, some 289 global Fortune 500 countries are participating in the expo, eager to tap into China's market of 1.4 billion people. For more on the CIIE, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Oregon is Yan Liang. She's a chair professor of economics at Well Amet University. From Arlington, Virginia, Arthur Dong is a teaching professor with the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. Also with us, Anthony Moretti is an associate professor with the Department of Communication and Organizational Leadership at Robert Morris University. And Andy Mock is a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Andy, the Chinese Premier Li Cheng delivered the keynote speech at the opening uh, of the China International Import Expo. And uh, in that speech, he reaffirmed China's commitment to lifting any kinds of restrictions on foreign investment. Let's listen. Since 2018, as the world's first national-level exposition dedicated to imports, the CIIE has kept to its funding mission of opening up China's market and sharing China's opportunities with the world and actively connected China to the rest of the world. It has played a stronger role as a major platform for international procurement, investment promotion, cultural exchange, and open cooperation, and established itself as an international public good for the world to share. So, Andy, there are something like 289 of the Fortune 500 companies at this year's Expo. How important is that? How significant is it? And what do you make of the Premier's promise to uh, expand access for foreign investors? Well, I think it's incredibly important, Anand. So, we all know that for business to be smoothly and profitably conducted, political stability and predictability is vital. So we've seen with China consistency, predictability, and reliability, and the direction is towards greater openness. We should also look at it in the global context as well. So uh, countries around the world are facing enormous challenges, and I think China's outlook is brightening. So we look at the recent IMF uh, update that uh, they expect the Chinese economy to grow at a higher than expected rate in 2023 and 2024. Uh, that really, this is um, a very positive signal uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, and CIIE, I think, is taking place. This version or this edition of it is taking place at a very important time, and I think does mark uh, much greater opportunities for global businesses in China. Yan Liang, uh, there are something like 154 countries and regions attending this year's uh, expo. China says that its imports of goods and services are expected to reach a combined $17 trillion over the next five years. Uh, I mean, clearly that's a huge opportunity or opportunities for exporters around the world. But what impact will this have on global economic growth? Yeah, good to talk to you, Anand. So I think this is very important. Uh, many of the companies from all over the world are coming to China to conduct businesses because they understand China represents a very large market. China has 400 million strong middle class, and the number is still growing. Um, China has imported over $2.7 trillion uh, worth of products last year, and it's going to continue to grow, as the Premier Li Qiang uh, predicted in the coming years. So I think, on the one hand, this is very important to boost global 
global demand uh, when the global economy is really in a bad shape, uh, not only because it's a slow recovery from the pandemic, but also the world is now uh, in you know multiple regional conflicts that are really dragging the economy behind. So I think it's very important for China's import to boost domestic uh, to boost global demand. But also I think very importantly um, with China's imports and exports, it really helped to rekindle and revitalize the global supply chain uh, to provide the world with you know intermediate goods, industrial machinery, and many other technologies that are very helpful um, for production, for supply and for global uh, development, especially in the global south. So I think all of these indicate that China is going to continue to play a very vital role in pushing forward the world economy and contributing to, again, one third of the global growth in the coming years. Arthur, uh, more than 200 U.S. businesses and uh, exhibitors are at this year's expo. Now, CGT CGTN spoke to the representatives of uh, some of those companies. In particular, we spoke to representatives from the health sector, uh, and we asked them about their hopes and expectations. To date, we've invested about 1.8 billion uh, RMB in research, manufacturing, facilities, and training. Um, and our plan is to continue uh, with those types of investments. The China market is extremely important. We believe that we have the opportunity to bring the best minimally invasive care uh, to, uh, to the Chinese population. And uh, so with our innovation um, and our work to expand access to the technology, uh, we think we can have an impact. Lily's been around for over 147 years with that mission around uh, making life better for people globally all over the world. Today, we have over 20 local partners, and we try to bring all of our resources, our people, our expertise, our experience to uh, the local biotechs to enable them to accelerate their innovation. Our goal is um, simultaneous drug development, and China's role in that is tremendous. Uh, we're going to continue that commitment to research and development. Over the next few years, between now and 2030, Lily is going to provide a really unique opportunity for the people here in China. That is over 40 new medicines delivering better, healthier, happier lives for people living all over China. So, Arthur, clearly a lot of optimism from those uh, U.S. business representatives. But where do you see the biggest opportunity for growth in China for U.S. companies? Yeah, certainly the uh, segment that you just relayed with us and shared with us with regard to the healthcare segment. Uh, that's been a, a very strong area of growth for the United States as U.S. companies, uh, both in the medical device field as well as in ma and medicines themselves, are world leaders in terms of the both the uh, both the production as well as development of of remedies for various drugs around the world, and they've certainly have had a very very strong uh, growth and uh, rate of success in China. The other areas where American companies uh, really excel are in the areas of technology. And so uh, I, uh, I understood that many of America's largest and most successful chip manufacturers in the semiconductor space are well represented uh, at this current trade fair. And they include uh, household names such as AMD, Qualcomm, as well as Micron Technologies. And so they haven't given up on the Chinese marketplace. And indeed, for many of these companies, China represents the single largest customer of their semiconductors in the world. So although we are uh, experiencing some challenges with regard to the production and sale of these products in China, uh, well, certainly the CEOs and leaders of these companies are, it seems, doubling down on the Chinese marketplace. So, Arthur, uh, those are the opportunities. Where do you see the biggest challenges coming from? Yeah, the biggest challenges will continue to be any of those technology products that are still related to uh, to this sort of uh, issue uh, of national security. And so some of the highest technology products, whether they be machinery or whether they be sort of developments in semiconductors, I think there will be continued sort of challenges with regard to the trade in these kinds of products, as well as ancillary services such as advanced level software. Anthony, um, the U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, he was also at the expo, and he said that the large-scale presence of U.S. companies at this year's expo is indicative of the commitment that the U.S. has to improving bilateral ties with China. Uh, he also spoke about another issue that we've been hearing about a lot in the news recently. Let's listen to what he said about that. We do not seek 
to decouple the economic relationship between us. We seek to move forward in two-way trade between the United States and China. Now, we are de-risking altering supply chains in critical materials and minerals in some cases, but that's because that's the smart thing to do post-pandemic. And of course, China has been de-risking as well. So, Anthony, there has been an easing of tensions in recent months, uh, for the past year, really, uh, in the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, how would you characterize it right now? I think cautious optimism might be a way to look at it. Um, you know, we, we know there have been a series of high-level visits primarily to China from U.S. officials in the last couple of weeks or so. Those have been Chinese officials coming to the United States. We know certainly there is uh, continued optimism and, con and a continued anticipation that the two presidents, Biden and Xi, will have a chance to talk at the APEC uh, uh, gathering in San Francisco in about a week's time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right now the signs are pointing to that same optimistic message. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you listen to what those business executives were talking about, everything was basically under the guise of, look, the two countries working together can do so much for each other and for the world that to do anything to put that under stress is both unnecessary and, un and certainly un uh, not warranted. And so one can hope that that is also the tone of the political conversations that take place that say, look, together we can do so much and apart, we are really more of, of a danger to each other and the world. And we don't really want to fathom that possibility. And the, the Australian Prime Minister, Anthony uh, Albanese, he was also at CIIE. Um, he's, he also met with the, the Chinese President Xi Jinping. In fact, he is the first Australian Prime Minister to be in Beijing to visit China in seven years. And if we look at you know, the relationship between the two countries um, in the recent few years, in 2020, China slapped tariffs on Australian imports of uh, beef, wine, rock lobsters. Uh, but do you think with the visit of Albanese that this could be a turning point for the two countries uh, and a way of probably starting uh, a new phase in their relationship? Anand, I certainly do think that this is uh, turning a leaf, uh, opening a new chapter on the bilateral relationship between China and Australia. And certainly, uh, Australia has uh, a lot to gain from this. Um, exports, of course, but also uh, Australia is a very important destination for Chinese students. So I think that uh, this is definitely uh, a very positive and welcome development. But I think if we draw the lens back a bit and look more broadly, that Australia is, of course, very closely politically, geopolitically, politically aligned with the United States. And what we're seeing here, I think, is an uneven but growing recognition uh, that the U.S. and uh, its band of, uh, of allies uh, really cannot defeat China, and that there are escalating costs to continuing this, uh, it, pursuing this antagonistic path. So I think we're also seeing more broadly uh, a recognition that uh, the advantages of working with China outweigh the cost of uh, a more provocative and confrontational stance towards China. Yang Liang, uh, Andy Mock was telling us earlier on about that IMF uh, forecast for Chinese growth. The IMF have revised their forecast and say that growth, um, well, it was set at 5 percent, but they now say it's going to be 5.4 percent. And this is Gita Gopinath, the IMF first deputy managing director. This is how she explained the upgrade that's been made by the IMF. Let's listen. The reason we upgraded with two two reasons for it. One is the third quarter GDP growth came, up, came out stronger than we expected. Uh, and it was importantly driven by stronger consumption than we had expected. So that's, that was one reason. And the second reason is the uh, additional fiscal stimulus that was recently announced. Uh, that is raising growth for this year. So, Yan Liang, what is your main takeaways from this revision by the IMF, and particularly the reasons for the uh, upgrade? 
Right. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think um, she gets it right that for the one on the one hand that you know China's growth uh, seem to be on a solid basis, especially now uh, the retail sales consumption have gone up, and so that shows there is the growth momentum. But also, I think China is waging ahead in terms of technologies, in terms of, for example, EV production and sales and exports. Um, so all of these would help to boost that demand side of the economy. And on the other hand, I think she gets it right. I think uh, there has been a lot of policy discussions going on these days. Um, the central government just rolled out a one trillion uh, yuan uh, bond issuance, and a lot of this money is going to help the local governments uh, to help relieve their um, debt. So I think that is definitely a great step to help um, to boost the economy. And I think furthermore, um, there are also um, policies that are at the monetary front that would help to defuse some of the risks in the real estate sector and also help to prevent um, any sort of major financial crises um, and to have more targeted credit that would go to support you know, viable property developers and so on and so forth. So I think when it comes to policies, uh, I think more will come down from the pipe. Um, it's clear that you know the economy could get more stimulus and China definitely has the policy space to have more fiscal stimulus and also monetary uh, targeting easing. So I think all these would say would, would um, you know uh, a group, uh, would um, sorry would validate um, her uh, assumption or her forecast that China's economy is going to continue to grow and grow strong. Arthur Dong, what do you make of this revised forecast by the IMF? Yeah, adding to what uh, Jan has uh, just expressed, I think. Uh, two issues here. Uh, when reports are articulated by Chinese authorities or policy, uh, uh, you know, policy uh, organizations, there's a degree of skepticism that sometimes comes along with those numbers uh, because they believe that there's a, bi a bit of bias, you know, in the reporting with regard to Chinese institutions. But when the IMF, you know, reports, everybody will certainly stand up and listen because it's seen as being more independent and less biased. And so this is confirmation that uh, although the Chinese economy is down, it's certainly not out. And uh, just as Yan has expressed, China's leaders have plenty of policy options and tools that can be deployed. And now that they're starting to move forward with the deployment of some of these measures, it's starting to regain confidence amongst investors around the world that uh, China is not only open but is welcoming uh, foreign investors as well as foreign companies to re-engage with the Chinese marketplace. Andy, uh, there's been a lot of attention being paid recently, a big focus on the Chinese auto industry, particularly uh, electric vehicles. Um, in fact, the auto exhibition at this year's CIIE um, was one of the biggest attractions. Um, CGTN's Zheng Chunyin, our reporter, uh, he put together this report on the latest technology that's on display. This is the automobile exhibition area of the 6th China International Import Expo. It features a variety of the state-of-the-art exhibits from around the world, including the latest electric vehicles from leading car makers and some very catchy cars with unique appearances or concepts. And now let's check them out. Speeding up its electrification initiative, Japanese car maker Honda is showcasing an electric concept car at the exhibition. It is designed to provide outstanding driving pleasure, vehicle stability, and handling. And a six-year CIIE attendee, U.S. automaker Ford, is also showcasing its models, such as Bronco and Render Pickup. Uh, I think this has to be one of the most exciting lineups we've ever had at any CIIE. And it's based on our off-road SUVs and trucks and also our on-road performance vehicles, Ford Bronco. It's the hardcore, versatile uh, SUV vehicle uh, that we will be bringing to China in the uh, second quarter of next year and also localizing here uh, for, our, for our Chinese customers. We're very excited, not just about the products, but about the experiences that they will bring for the, for the Chinese customers. This is another new concept vehicle that made its debut at this year's CIIE. Uh, it's designed to make life easier for those who use wheelchairs and for those who are uh, physically challenged. Uh, with a simple tap on your mobile app, uh, you can just relax and effortlessly move in and out of the vehicle. And there's also a dedicated uh, space behind for the wheelchair storage. 
HRC, a Chinese solution provider for composite materials, is also showcasing a carbon fiber sports car at the SIG China International Import Expo. The company staff said the application of carbon fiber has achieved the ultimate lightweight of the entire vehicle, helping to improve energy efficiency and range and reduce carbon emissions. Uh, so in general, uh, carbon fiber is seen as one of the most ideal replacement material uh, for the new energy vehicle, uh, which represents the great future of uh, uh, future mobility and uh, for energy saving purpose. Participants also said they are looking forward to showcasing more high quality products at next year's expo and to embracing the opportunities presented by China. Zheng Chunying, CGTN, Shanghai. So Andy, uh, China is now um, a global leader in electric vehicles. It's also the biggest exporter of vehicles overall in the world. How did it manage to get so far ahead of the competition in this particular sector? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons for this, Anon. So first of all, uh, the government recognized that this was very important, not just from a commercial and technological perspective, but from an environmental sustainability perspective as well. So I think it demonstrates the Chinese government's ability to identify, integrate, and implement uh, various policy objectives into a coherent strategy. It also, I think, represents the technological advances made by China uh, in research and development, because the foundational technology for EVs, of course, uh, is batteries. So China is a global leader here. And I think these points are well appreciated. What is less well understood is that the Chinese market uh, is not only large, but very diverse. And EVs allow manufacturers to innovate and experiment in ways that were just not possible with internal combustion engine vehicles. So you combine this large diverse market with very fast clock speed, what I call clock speed, meaning uh, the ability to iterate, to do things in China uh, is much faster than in other parts of the world. And then we also have to combine this with uh, infrastructure. Uh, that the ability for the country to roll out charging stations, uh, the other ancillary support needed uh, for a vibrant uh, EV ecosystem means that it's not just the Chinese companies uh, that are thriving uh, in the Chinese EV market today, but the foreign companies as well, because they also have the opportunity uh, to learn and develop much more quickly. And I think this is what's making China such uh, an EV export powerhouse. Anthony uh, Moretti, the, uh, we talked very briefly at the beginning of the show about the APEC summit, that's the Asia-Pacific Corporation meetings that will be taking place in San Francisco next week. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of speculation that President Xi Jinping of China will be meeting with his United States counterpart. What are expectations uh, for, from the U.S. On, on this meeting that's taking place? I think what the U.S. would like to demonstrate is that, number one, it is trying to find a way to bridge both the challenges and the opportunities of, of, of the two countries. The challenges have been documented in, in many circumstances, um, including sometimes where it was probably more hype and nonsense than it was you know, a, a credibility or a real concern. I'm thinking of the balloon incident, for example, from, from earlier this year. So I think what we want to see is what you just saw in that brief video right there of, of, of the two presidents shaking hands in front of the cameras, but also talking seriously and meaningfully behind the cameras. You know, the, the, the U.S. Has, has made clear that overall its goals for, uh, for, for this conference are for an interconnected world or a better interconnected world. Mm -hmm. Meaning that whether it's the U.S. or Canada or Mexico or Australia or Russia or China or whichever country you want to talk about uh, in, in the, that make up APEC, they want to see prosperity there. They want to see innovation in the report we just saw about some of those cars. And, and I wonder if maybe we can get one or two of those shipped to the U.S., maybe get, our, get my hands on one of those. Mm -hmm. Probably not, but you can dream, right? Uh, but they want to see innovation thrive. And then the last thing that they're talking about, obviously, and this is consistent with what the Biden administration tries to talk about in all cases, is this idea that all people uh, will, will benefit in some form or fashion by what uh, takes place at APEC and the, and the ideals and, and the uh, um, talks that come out of that. 
Andy Mock, um, you know, looking at the meetings that will be taking place in San Francisco, what do you think China's expectations would be? I mean, the last time President Xi met with President Biden, that was uh, on the sidelines of that G20 summit, which took place in Bali in November. Well, I think China has been uh, consistent and uh, clear on what its hopes and expectations are for relations with the United States. And that's, of course, that uh, the relations be conducted on the basis of mutual respect, respect for sovereignty, uh, resolving disputes uh, through negotiation and, and consultation. Uh, so I think that, we, of course, we'll see a continuation of that. Yeah. Um, I think some of the shorter-term questions are around uh, the technology sanctions. Uh, hopefully, the U.S. will recognize. And as we're seeing with CIIE, there were 47 uh, semiconductor companies yeah. participating, uh, many American, uh, that the U.S. will see that this so-called uh, small yard high fence strategy, one, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it may even accelerate. China's technological advances, but more importantly for the United States, undermines the long-term strategic competitiveness of these companies. Yeah. So I think this is something China wants to see, and hopefully the U.S. will recognize as well. Arthur, the trade tariffs that were initially imposed by former President Donald Trump, they're still in place despite uh, expectations that President Biden may have changed course, but they are still there. I mean, what kind of impact have those tariffs made on bilateral trade between the two countries and also on global growth? Yeah, certainly the tariffs have made uh, imported products uh, from China more expensive here in the United States at a time uh, when lower prices on goods uh, would be most certainly welcome. The American consumer and the average family feel very stretched. And as a result uh, of that, it's uh, certainly being expressed in the polls. Uh, Biden gets low marks and low scores for his handling of the economy. And American families, uh, despite the fact that we have a close to 100 percent employment in the United States, are still extremely concerned about the cost of goods uh, that they buy on a regular basis. And so re-examining the tariff picture and the issues uh, that uh, are between the United States and China may go a long way to sort of uh, reducing the inflationary impact that American consumers face on a daily basis. Okay, and that is where we are going to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C.